Hello, my dear colleagues in Israel. I am very happy to present this webinar. I'm grateful to Professor Boas Weiss, and my good friends, Dr. Nina Kaiden and Dr. Alon Schwim. For the international webinar of the Israeli Society, I will speak about could the new ORAD system be used in a clinical setting? And I prefer to be in Israel now and to show it in reality, but um, for the time being, we have to do it through webinars. The IOTA collaboration is always focused on how to classify and manage ovarian tumors. And first, we see a lot of normal ovaries. We see a lot of functional cysts, and we should avoid trying to uh, do operating uh, procedures on them. Sometimes you have to operate on benign tumors, not always. In borderline tumors, it's important to preserve fertility in young women. With invasive tumors, it's very important not to have any spilling because that will make the prognosis worse. And in metastatic tumors, it's important to detect the primary tumor, and that may be a gastric cancer or colon cancer or breast cancer, before you try doing debulking surgery. In terms of definitions have been published in 2000, so that's 20 years now, together with Professor Valentin and Born and Vergote. And this was highlighted also by beautiful presentations by Daniela Fischerova. And based on these terms and definitions, we have had many research uh, procedures studies, we had a lot of international meetings, and the next meeting will be on the 8th and the 9th of April 2021 in Leuven. That might be virtual as well. And before starting uh, any study, you should speak the same language. For this, it's so important to study the definitions and the terms and the measurements. And that paper in the White Journal is uh, freely available. And that will explain every structure that you will see. So a solid component is a structure that has high echogenicity, suggested of tissue like myometrium or enstroma, like you see in fibroids and fibromas. But a wide ball in dermoid cyst is not solid tissue. So that's very important. And that's, of course, um, arbitrary, it's an agreement, and that's why you need to come to a consensus and to say this is not a solid component. We know this is, consists of hair, of sebum, maybe cartilage, bone, but it's not regarded as solid tissue. On the other hand, the blood clot may be looking like a solid lesion, and then it helps to push on the lesion, then you see it moving, or you see it moving like here, a gel-like structure, you can see that there's no flow inside the blood clot. You see flow surrounding the hemorrhagic corpus lithium cyst. But only if you're in doubt, you call it solid. The definition of a population is a projection, and it's always a solid protrusion into the cyst cavity from the cyst wall with a height of greater or equal to three millimeters. A population, by definition, is always solid tissue. You don't measure the wall, the thickness of the wall, together with a population. A protrusion that's less than three millimeters in height, that's not a population, but that assists wall irregularity. Then there's a color score, and color score one means no flow. By the way, color score zero doesn't exist. Color score two is minimal flow. Color score three is moderate flow. And color score four is very strong flow, like you can see also in benign cases like corpus luteum but of, or like in an abscess, so in infection, but also most of the time in cancer, like you can see in this case. Then we developed the simple rules that were published in 2008. And this is in the era before computers were used in clinical practice and before we had the apps. And for this, we have features of malignant tumors, and we have benign features. And if you have, for example, one malignant feature, for example, at least four populations, and another malignant feature, very strong blood flow, 
then you can say that the tumor is most likely malignant, just on the on a condition that has no benign features. On the contrary, if you have only benign features and no malignant features, then it's probably a benign tumor. Here again, you see the malignant features, irregular solid tumor. So irregular means that the outline of the solid tumor is irregular. And solid means that at least 80% of the tumor is solid in one plane. For example, here you see some cystic space, but overall this is solid. The presence of ascites, and ascites means fluid outside the pouch of the Douglas, at least four populations, irregular multilocular solid tumor of at least 10 centimeters, and coloscope four, so a very strong blood flow. The unilocular cyst, that's a benign feature. The tumor with a larger solid component less than seven millimeters, acoustic shadows, smooth multilocular tumor less than 10 centimeters, and color score one, so if there's no flow, these are benign features. And the simple rules produced very good results. So in this uh, um, systematic review, analysis of 47 articles, you see that the IOTA models, so like the simple rules and subject subjective assessment, are better than any traditional risk of malignancy index. But there are some cases that are missing, so inconclusive cases. And this is solved by making the APNEX model. And this was published only in 2014. It was based on 6,000 tumors, uh, 2,000 malignancies, 4,000 benign tumors. And the features of the model, the variables, are here. So it's age of the patients. It's very easy to... Um, easy variable to uh, include in a model. Oncology center is more doubtful, but it's very important because if you're working in an oncology center, your case mix will be different than if you're working in a regional hospital or in a private hospital. C125 helps to differentiate between stage two and four cancer versus metastatic disease. In metastatic disease, it will be lower. And stage one versus two to four, in stage one, it will be lower. As you know, almost 50% of stage one disease has normal C1 to 5 levels. But it's not really helpful to distinguish between benign and malignancy, but it's helpful to distinguish between the subgroups. And then you have six ultrasound variables, which are not very complicated. The first is maximal diameter of the lesion. So in any diameter, the largest diameter of the lesion. The second is the maximal diameter of the largest solid component in any direction. The third variable is more than 10 cis locules, yes or no. So you don't need to count everyone, but you simply have to say this is more than 10 cis locules. And then the number of populations, and there you have to count to a tree. So it's one, zero, one, two, three or more. And sometimes it's difficult to say, is this one population or is it two populations? So the rule is you measure from the inside of the cyst wall. And if the height is more than three millimeters, that's certainly a population. And if this indentation is less than 50% of the maximal height, then this population and this population are separate. Acoustic shadows, as you see in here, that's very common in benign tumors, but beware, you can see it in malignant tumors as well, but it's more likely to be a benign tumor if you see them. Then the presence of ascites, so that means fluid outside the pouch of Douglas is here. Sometimes you see fluid, that's not ascites, but if you see fluid between the bladder and the uterus here, or above the uterus, then it's ascites. So in summary, maximal diameter of the lesion, maximal diameter of the largest solid component, more than 10 cis locules, yes or no, populations, acoustic shadows, yes or no, and ascites, yes or no. Based on these ultrasound variables and the clinical variables like age and your center where you're working, you can make a calculation. 
And you can simply use the calculator, the formula, but that's very difficult to use in clinical reality. You can also go online to the website, yotagroup.org, and there you will find a free calculator where you can insert the age of the patient, oncology center, yes or no, maximal diameter of the lesion, and QMC125, but this is optional, so you don't have to fill it in. But if you fill it in, you get a better prediction of the type of malignancy. But it's not very needed for looking at benign or malignancy. So this might be the results. Chance of a benign tumor in this case is 53%. Risk of malignancy, 47%. And then you get the specific subgroups. It's almost 40% risk that it's borderline. Stage 1, stage 2 to 4, or very low risk of metastatic disease. So in this case, it's more likely to be a malignancy because if it's above the cutoff of 10 or 20%, depending on what you choose, you call it malignant. And then if you look for the type of malignancy, it's most likely a borderline tumor. So in this case, you could do fertility-preserving surgery. You can also have the apps, and if you download the app, you can fill it in, and then you can see the prior risk. You see the risk depending on the variables that you introduce. So this is much more likely to be a borderline tumor again. And in more and more ultrasound machines, the UpNext model is now integrated. It's been externally validated in many studies. Here I show you some. Uh, the overall AUC, the area under the uh, ROC curve, is 0.94. So this means that it is a very good discrimination between benign and malignant tumors. This is a very recent study published in the BMJ where we uh, validated the different models, like the risk of malignancy index, which is still very common in some countries. Logistic regression model two, simple rules risk model, and then up next without C125 and with C125. You see the difference is minimal. There's not much difference whether you use C125 or not to distinguish between benign and malignant tumors. So again, the first step is distinguish between benign versus malignant. If it's malignant, so if it's above a certain cutoff, then you might see that it's more likely to be a borderline tumor, uh, stage one of an cancer, stage two to four of an cancer, or a secondary metastasis to the ovary. And in the first case, of course, you can do fertility sparing surgery. In the second group, you do surgical staging, but you avoid any spelling. In stage two to four, either you can give primary chemotherapy or you can make a true cut biopsy to the to look for the type of tumor. And in metastatic tumors, you can also do a true cut biopsy and you can start looking with mammography, maybe with gastroscopy, maybe with a whole body MRI or a CT scan to look for another primary tumor which has metastasized to the ovary. And then we come to the collaboration with the American College of Radiology. And we started three years ago. And this was mainly because the United States um, is dominated by sonographers doing ultrasound scan and not gynecologists like in Europe. And in this area, the radiologists have the practice of using the b score for breasts um, and other red score, there was really a lack of collaboration between ultrasound specialists and models versus the typical features that, that are integrated into different red systems. First, we tried to harmonize and our lexicon. And for this, we try to merge the terms and definitions by IOTA with the American practice. And the differences were really great. It was very often heard. This is very difficult to digest. And should we really adopt this? And should we really adopt that? So it was a compromise. But in the end, I think we achieved 
a common lexicon, and this is integrating all the ORATS uh, features, and it's fully based on IOTA and common clinical practice in the United States. Where you will see that morphology is also uh, in the same way, unilocular, unilocular solid, multilocular, multilocular solid, or solid tumor. We use the same system for color score, so color score one, two, three, and four. And again, color score one means no flow, and color score two is minimal flow, moderate flow, or very strong flow. And then this year, the ORAT system was finally published. You see it's a real collaboration between uh, researchers from different universities, Vanderbilt, uh, UCSF, Harvard, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, McGill, and uh, University of Toronto in Canada. And we tried to come up with a system that's really clinically useful and that really helps you to manage patients with ovarian tumors. The first step, you look for normal ovary, functional changes, that's ORATS1. Then you apply classic benign descriptors, and we will come back to this later, but it's mainly unilocular cyst with either ground glass appearance or hemorrhagic content or um, clear anechoic uh, uh, content. And these are very easy to recognize. They should be less than 10, 10, 10 centimeters. And these are classified as ORATS2 because it's almost certainly benign. If the classic benign descriptors do not appear, then you use the UPNEX model. You can also use the features developed within the ORATS collaboration, but from IOTA, we really recommend the UPNEX model for the reasons I will give later. And if you apply the UPNEX model, as we just discussed, and if the risk is less than 1%, then it's ORATS2. If the risk is between 1 and less than 10%, it's ORATS3, no risk. If it's between 10 and less than 50, it's 4. And if it's between 50 and 100, it's ORATS5. So that's a high risk patient. Then you apply this traffic light system. If it's green, you can go for conservative management. If the patient has no symptoms. If the patient has symptoms, you can go for surgery. If it's orange, it can be done by the local gynecologist. And in the red case, you refer the patient to specialized oncology care. You see ORATS4 is a little bit in between because in the Netherlands, they will say we don't want too many false positives. So we have limited capacity in the oncology units. So ORATS4 goes to the local gynecologist. In many other countries, they will say ORATS4 and 5 should go to specialized care to a gynecologist because then the survival is better for the patient. So how can we use it in clinical practice? You see here a patient with a ground glass appearance in a unilocular cyst. He's 30 years old. The cyst is 53 by 48 by 45 millimeters in diameter. And the color score is two. So you see minimal flow in the cyst wall. Are there any benign descriptors? And you can immediately see what they are. It's unilocular tumor with ground glass echogenicity. And this is really applicable here. And that's suggestive of endometrioma. Sometimes you see unilocular tumor with mixed echogenicity. That's suggestive of a benign cystic teratoma. If it's unilocular anechoic, then it's more suggestive of a simple cyst or a cyst adenoma. And if it's a remaining tumor with regular cyst walls, then it's also a benign descriptor. So here you see classic benign descriptors. One of them is present. So this is classified as ORATS2, almost certainly benign. In case of an endometrioma, obviously, if the patient has pain, she will be operated. But uh, this can be done by a specialized surgeon in endometriosis surgery and not by an oncology. And it was a benign endometrioma. If you then look for other features in this tumor, you see it's a solid tumor. Certainly with color doppler, you can see that this whole area is solid. 
It's color score four. You see, that's a very strong blood flow. It's not a big tumor, but it's certainly something that needs further attention. The patient was 20, 62 years old. It's a unilateral solid lesion. It's irregular. A small lesion, 39 by 27 by 26 millimeters. There's no acoustic shadow. There's no ascites. And C125 is 42. So benign descriptors, none of them is applicable. So we cannot use them. Therefore, we go to the Upnex model. And if you fill in 62 years, oncology center, yes. Maximal diameter of the lesion is the same as the, the maximal diameter of solid part, 39. More than 10 cis locules, no. Number of populations, zero. Two six headers, no. No ascites. If you don't have serum C125, you see the risk of malignancy is 64%. The risk of a metastatic tumor goes up from 4, higher risk, to 13%. So the relative risk is 3.28. If we now have C125 available and it's 42, then we see that the relative risk of a metastatic tumor goes even up to 4.2. Of course, it can also be stage 2 to 4 of an cancer, but the relative risk of a metastatic tumor is higher. So you should first look for another primary tumor. And in this case, we fill in the risk. It's 64. So this is certainly ORATS 5. And this was a metastatic lymphoma in the ovary. Next case. This is a more difficult one. You see multilocular solid tumor. On the other hand, you see acoustic shadows. Not very strong, but uh, in some areas you see acoustic shadows. He's 77 years old, multilocular solid tumor, 63 by 40 by 34 millimeters, more than 10 cis locules, one large population. No, uh, well, there is acoustic shadows, but no ascites. And the color score was low, it was only two. C125 is also normal, 22. Benign descriptors are not present, so we cannot use them. The largest diameter of the lesion, the largest diameter of the solid parts, 63 and 18 millimeters, has more than 10 cis locules, one population, acoustic shadows, yes. Ascites, no, and serum C125 is normal. So here you see the risk of malignancy is not very high, but it's above the 18. It's 18%, so it's above 10%, so we would uh, classify it as at least ORATS3 and uh, possibly malignant, so we would be very careful with this patient. Um, sorry, it's ORATS4, sorry for this. And C125 means that real relative risk is 1.6, so the highest of all the relative risks is borderline. So if it's malignant, it's most likely to be a borderline tumor. And here you see it's between 10 and 50%, so ORATS4, and it proved to be a borderline malignant serous cystadenofibroma. You know, cystadenofibromas are sometimes very difficult to classify because of the solid lesion, because it looks rather malignant. But if you then see specific features in a tumor, and for this, I think subjective assessment and experience is still very important, you can add other tumor markers or you can do other presumable diagnosis. For example, if you have a tumor that looks like a Swiss cheese, then you should think about a high isodial, and sometimes you see hyperplasia or a very thick endometrium. In this case, you have to think about granulosa cell tumor, of course. If you see a tumor that is more nodular and solid, like in here, and if it's a young patient, then you should check LDH, and most often it will be a dysgerminoma. If you see a tumor where there's acoustic shadows, and it's a regular outline, smooth, solid tumor, 
probably color score here will be two. Then you think, of course, of fibroma of the ovary. If you then measure C125, you often get false positive results. So you will think this might be a malignancy, but of course, it's a benign fibroma of the ovary. In this case, you see a very strange appearance. It's hyperechoic. It's a very uh, weird looking tumor. And this is more, more likely to be an immature teratoma. In, in contrast to other benign cystic teratomas, you will see flow insights. You see flow insights of teratoma, you always have to think about immature teratoma. Then very often, alpha fetoprotein will be elevated. So additional tumor markers might be of help, certainly in girls and young women and in unilateral tumors where you might suspect a malignant germ cell tumor. And in this germinoma, as we said, you can have LDH elevated. In immature teratoma, it might be alpha fetoprotein. In mixed germ cell tumors, of course, you can have all three. In choriocarcinoma, typically you have HCG that's raised. And in York sac tumors, it might be alpha fetoprotein or LDH. In summary, the IOTA studies, um, you can find more information on the website, iotagroup.org, have been developed in different phases, phase one, phase 1b, phase two, three, four, five, six, seven. And all these phases were aimed at developing an evidence-based algorithm for the management of all of our tumors. In the meantime, we have more than 28,000 patients included in different studies. There's more than 125 scientific papers. We have certified, certified IOTA members from all over the world, more than 10,000. And the aim is, of course, to have a positive impact on clinical practice and patient care. Thank you for your attention. Hello, Dirk. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much for this excellent and very organized talk. Thank you. And uh, we have a few questions from the audience, although you do not see them. And I will start with the first one uh, from uh, Professor Yaron Salel, which is How can the IOTA classify a stroma ovary? Um, stroma ovary is a quite difficult one because uh, you have some solid tissue there, but you have the stroma pearl. So these are small, um, solid parts um, with poor vascularization that you may see inside a multilocal assist. Um, up next, we'll see that there's a little solid tissue. So in most of the cases, it will be um, classified as low risk. Of course, C125 will be low, but uh, as we discussed, C125 is not fully reliable to distinguish between benign and malignant. So it really doesn't help the Atnex model. But in a malignant group, it does help. So therefore, if you think it's a malignancy, then it might be helpful to distinguish between different types of malignancy. With a CA. OK. And another question from uh, Dr. Zajczyk which is, is the, ADEX, is the ADEX model as accurate for rare ovarian tumors as it is for the common ovarian tumors that we encounter? Um, I think yes. On the other hand, it's not been uh, trained on many young patients and these germ cell tumors are often in young patients. But luckily they look uh, more like malignant tumors, for example, uh, granulosa cell tumor, this germinoma, uh, they have a lot of solid tissue, strong vascularity, so they look uh, very suspicious for malignancy. And so in this way, uh, I don't think there's many misclassifications in these tumors. Okay. We have another question from our second moderator, from Nina, which was hooked on one of your sentences, and she is asking, can you speak a little on what you said regarding the machine built-in platforms for risk calculation? how to use them, and how do they work? Uh, you mean the machine? Those that are in the machine itself that you have shown. Yes, 
So different companies have asked, can we use the Upnex model and put it in our machines? And of course, we approve this because it's uh, published in the BMJ. So the formula is open to anyone. So it's uh, it's open. It has no patent. So it's not um, that nobody can use it. Uh, in order to make it more useful for the uh, clinicians, we made the apps. We give it online, but uh, it's now also more and more installed in machines from GE, uh, from uh, Samsung, so from different companies. And I think in the end, most ultrasound machines will contain more intelligence inside. And I think this is a very good way to make the assessment more reliable and to increase the patient workflow. So um, I think you will simply have to ask your um, local dealer whether they have it or not. But uh, to be sure, we have no royalties on this. So it's, uh, and there's no patent on the Upnex model. So it's free for the world to use. We usually use the web for that, and that's another question was that um, regarding to what should we use? According to the study that was recently published in the BMJ, the Atmix model seems to be as accurate as the simple rules and provides more specific diagnosis. Do you think this is the time now to move for it as to use it ex exclusively? Yes. So you can use the simple rules and many people uh, like the simple rules because they have been using it for more than 12 years now. Um, and the simple rules model is accurate. That's been published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So it's a good model. Uh, we have now also the calculator installed on our website, but we don't recommend it very much because uh, I think Upnex is at least as good as a simple rules risk model. And it gives you much more um, insight in the type of tumor. And I think this is particularly relevant for borderline tumors, but also for metastatic tumors, because if you see that the risk of a metastatic disease in the ovary is more than 10%, it's better not to start with debulking surgery, but uh, it's much better to try to look for the time. And as you've seen in the presentation, that might be a lymphoma. But it might be a breast cancer, but I would also recommend the mammography in these uh, patients. Absolutely. And it might be any other type of primary tumor, like gastric cancer in a Kuchenberg tumor. We have uh, many questions regarding what are the names of the apps, etc. So we will publish it in our website of the Israeli Society. Oh, we publish it for all those who are asking that. Uh, we have one last question uh, from uh, Professor Leibovitz. The specifications of your color Doppler's use and setup regarding an ecological setup for ovarian tumors. Do you have any recommendation? For the certification? For the setup of your, do of your Doppler's in order not to have false positive and false negative Doppler's. Uh, the PRF should be between 0.3 and 0.6. And the game, the Doppler game. Then, the Doppler game. Um, I think the is also on the line. You better be able to be because he's making a phone call. Yes. Um, so you first increase the game. And then you slowly decrease the gain until the artifacts have disappeared so that you don't see color spots inside the fluid or in uh, structures that are not vascular. And then you have the optimal sensitivity for flow. So there's uh, two buttons which are really important, PRF in 0.3 and 0.6 and color gain. Thank you very much. I think that the ADEX model is a very good also for communication with our co-doctors, those in the surgery room. And um, it was a fantastic talk. And we welcome you to Israel whenever we can fly and come. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Bye-bye.